Hello everyone, and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video, I'll be talking about the properties and synthesis of alkenes, molecules with double bonds. By the end of this video, as always, the questions that you should be able to answer for yourself are what are the bonds in alkenes, and how do they affect reactivity? Which alkenes are more stable than others? How do I synthesize alkenes? And how do I determine the product distributions of those syntheses? I'll be talking a little bit about E2 and E1 reactions in this video, so if you'd like to review those mechanisms, please go ahead and subscribe, and also take a look at those videos. An alkene is any compound with a carbon-carbon double bond. So this is the simplest alkene, ethylene, where we have two carbons with a double bond between them, and then we have two more hydrogens on each of those carbons. And if you remember from my video on orbital hybridization, these carbons are sp2 hybridized. And that means this alkene will adopt a trigonal geometry, where we have 120 degree bond angles between these hydrogens and carbons. We could draw sort of an orbital picture of ethylene right here, where we have the two carbons, the two hydrogens on each of those carbons, and we'll draw one coming out of the page and one going into the page for each carbon. And then we will have our sigma bond right here, and that's where our bond is in the plane between the two atoms. And remember, in double bonds we also have a pi bond, and that's going to be the p orbitals perpendicular to the plane of bonding, so in this case going up and down, and the overlap between those orbitals will be the pi bond, and that makes our double bond for an alkene. And it's very important to remember that double bonds are indeed stronger than single bonds, so that's pretty self-explanatory, but pi bonds themselves are weaker than sigma bonds. So because of that decreased overlap with pi bonding, those are weaker than the in-the-plane overlap in sigma bonds. I'd like to briefly discuss the acidity of alkenes, and to quantify that acidity, remember we use pKa. So for this reaction, where we have ethylene, and I will draw in the hydrogens explicitly on this ethylene here, plus some generic base, I'll just write B minus. And this will be in equilibrium, so if we have the base abstracting a proton from this ethylene, we will end up with this carbanion, where one of the hydrogens has been abstracted, and we end up with a minus charge on that carbon here, plus the conjugate acid of the base, so let's just write BH. And the pKa for this reaction, how I've written it, is around 45. So we know that alkanes, with carbon-carbon single bonds only, have pKa's of around 50. So alkenes are slightly more acidic than alkanes, but not by very much. So a pKa of 45 means that for basically all of the bases that we encounter in organic chemistry, nothing will be able to abstract that proton from the double-bonded carbon in the alkene. Let's also talk about the stability of different configurations of alkenes. So we can use this reaction here, which I'll discuss a little bit in a different video, where we have, let's start with propylene. So this is our three carbon version of an alkene. And when we treat it with hydrogen gas over a catalyst, so we can sometimes use palladium over activated carbon, so we can just write palladium slash C, or also platinum oxide, is a good catalyst for this reaction. And this will hydrogenate our alkene to form the corresponding alkane. So getting rid of that double bond and adding two hydrogens. These reactions are generally exothermic, so they release heat in the process. And by measuring the amount of heat that we get from the reaction, we can say a little bit about the stability of several different alkenes. If we look at three different four carbon alkenes with one double bond each, we'll look at trans-2-butene, where the substituents along the double bond are across from each other, so trans, cis-2-butene, where those substituents are now together on the same side, and also 1-butene, where that double bond is now between carbons 1 and 2 instead of 2 and 3. If we subject each of these to our catalytic hydrogenation conditions, I won't write them out here, but that's our hydrogen over maybe palladium on carbon, we will get the same product in each case. We'll just get butane. However, the amounts of energy that's released will differ. So it turns out that for trans-2-butene, our first alkene here, we get about minus 116 kilojoules per mole. Cis-2-butene gives us minus 120 kilojoules per mole. And 1-butene 
yields about minus 127 kilojoules per mole. So we notice that these are giving out more and more heat as we go down the list. And if you remember from my video on cycloalkanes, there's a link to that at the top of the screen, I talk about how when a reaction like this is more exothermic, that means the starting material was less stable. So what that means for us here is that the 1-butene starting material is the least stable out of these three, whereas trans-2-butene is the most stable. So if you can see the pattern, that means that the more substituted our alkene is, generally the more stable it is. So our two alkenes here, where the double bond is between carbons 2 and 3, we call those di-substituted, because they both have two alkyl groups on that double bond. And they are indeed more stable than the monosubstituted alkene, the 1-butene, because they release less heat when hydrogenated. And this is because of the hyperconjugation offered by those additional alkyl groups. So from my video on radical halogenation, you might remember that hyperconjugation is when we donate electron density from those alkyl groups across sigma bonds. So the more alkyl groups we have along that double bond, the more hyperconjugation, and the more hyperconjugation, the higher stability. We can also notice that trans-substituted alkenes are more stable than cis. And this is generally because of the steric hindrance in cis-substituted alkenes. So if we have two alkyl groups on the same side, those are going to be a little bit congested and therefore a lot more unstable than a trans-alkene where those alkyl groups are across from each other. I want to go on a quick tangent here and talk about cis and trans and the nomenclature we use for alkenes. So if I were to draw this alkene, where we have a four-carbon backbone, a double bond between carbons two and three, and also a chlorine atom here on the double bond. Would we label this as a cis or trans isomer of the alkene? Well, actually, it's going to be neither. We can't really use cis or trans nomenclature for this because we have too many different substituents and it's not really going to be sensical. What we can do instead is use the con angled prelog nomenclature that we learned when talking about absolute configurations. Uh, again, I'll link that video at the top of the screen here. So remember, this goes by atomic number. And what we do is look at each of the carbons of the double bond, take a look at their substituents, and label whichever is the higher priority and lower priority substituent. So for the left-hand carbon here, we have a methyl group and a hydrogen. So the carbon on that methyl group is going to be priority 1 and the hydrogen priority 2. We do the same thing for the right-hand carbon, where we have the chlorine is priority 1 and the methyl group is priority 2. So now, if the priority 1 substituents are on the same side as they are here, we call this a Z isomer. That comes from the German word zusammen, meaning together. If the first priority substituents are on the opposite sides, then we call this an E isomer. Again, that comes from the German word entgegen, which means opposite or across from. So what that means is that this alkene here, we would call a Z isomer instead of cis or trans. And the EZ nomenclature lets us talk about a wider variety of alkenes than just ones that are substituted with hydrocarbons. Finally, I want to talk about a couple reactions that we can use to synthesize alkenes. We've already discussed some of these in the E2 and E1 reactions videos that I have, but we're going to talk about a few more minutia of those reactions. So let's look at this haloalkane here, where we have a cyclohexane ring, and then a methyl group and a bromide on this same carbon up here. So this is a tertiary haloalkane. If we treat this with sodium ethoxide in ethanol, so again, that's a strong base. And in this case, it's a non-sterically hindered base. Ethoxide is pretty small. So because this is a tertiary haloalkane and we have a strong base, we're probably going to undergo an E2 reaction. So with an E2 reaction, we could get two different products from this starting material. We could remove the proton from the methyl group, giving us this product, where the alkene is between these two carbons. We could also remove a proton from the cyclohexane ring, giving us this alkene, where the double bond is inside the ring. So which one of these products would be the major product in our reaction? Well, like we just talked about, usually the more substituted alkene will be more stable than the least substituted one. So our second product is a tri-substituted alkene, whereas the first one is only di-substituted. So that means this right-hand product will probably be our major product. This is also called the Zaitsev or the thermodynamically favored product 
because the more substituted alkene is more thermodynamically stable. However, if we take the same starting material here, the cyclohexane ring and the tertiary alkyl bromide, and treat it with potassium tert-butoxide in tert-butyl alcohol, we could again get a mixture of the same two products. So the alkene with the double bond out of the ring, as well as the alkene with the double bond in the ring. But because this base is very bulky and sterically hindered, it's going to be difficult for it to remove one of the protons from inside the ring. Since we have all of the steric congestion from the methyl group and from the ring itself, we're probably going to remove the proton from the methyl group instead. So that gives us the first product as the major product, because this methyl group is less hindered, whereas the second product will be minor, because although that alkene is more thermodynamically stable, it is more sterically hindered. This is called the Hoffman product, or the kinetically favored product, because although the less substituted alkene is less thermodynamically stable, with less steric hindrance, it's going to form a more stable transition state, and a more stable transition state is under the domain of chemical kinetics, not thermodynamics. We could also apply some of the things we've learned with another reaction, where we can start with this alcohol, so this is 2-butanol, and treating it with concentrated sulfuric acid, and heating it up. And that will undergo dehydration of the alcohol, so dehydrating this to an alkene in probably an SN1 reaction. For this starting material, we could actually get three different products. We could get this first product, where the alkene is between carbons 1 and 2, so that would be abstracting the proton from the end carbon. We could get the second product, where the alkene is between carbons 2 and 3, and we also have a trans alkene, so those alkyl groups are opposite each other. Finally, we could get the alkene again between carbons 2 and 3, but the cis isomer, where the alkyl groups are on the same side. And just like we talked about, the major product here will probably be the middle product, where we have the more substituted alkene, so it's disubstituted, and it is also trans stereochemistry so we have pretty negligible steric hindrance. The other two products will be minor. The first one, because it is less substituted, so less thermodynamically stable. And the last product is minor, because again, it is a cis isomer, and that's gonna be more sterically hindered than the trans isomer. So I hope this video was a good introduction to alkenes, and also some of the issues or advantages we can use in synthesizing them. If you learned something from this video, please like and subscribe to my channel. Like my page on Facebook at Total Organic Chemistry, and check out my website on the screen. If you're willing and able, please consider donating to my Patreon page, and that really helps me to continue creating all these types of content for all of you. Thanks for watching.